Hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for taking the time to attend this um, talk and Q&A session. My name is Simran. I study applied medical science. Um, I chose the course because I really like the idea of studying disease and therapeutics from a scientific and molecular point of view and the course has really allowed me to appreciate the fusion between science and medicine. Um, I'll hand over to Ursula in a minute, but before I do, I just wanted to inform everyone that um, you can submit questions into the question box and then during the Q&A session, I will start, um, I'll start relaying them to Ursula to answer your questions. Um, so a bit about our speaker. Um, Ursula specializes in the treatment of prostate and bladder cancer, and she leads quite a few clinical trials. As part of UCL, Urs Ursula runs the oncology teaching department and, the under and is the, the lead for the undergrad um, program for UCL Cancer Institute. Um, and with that, I hand over to Ursula. Um, well, thanks for joining us all today um, and thanks for um, Simran for the introduction. So I'm Ursula McGovern, so I'm a consultant medical oncologist at UCLH, but I have two hats. I'm a working clinician and I treat prostate and bladder cancer, um, but I also have quite a big role in medical education and in particular for the oncology teaching run by UCL. So today I just wanted to give a short talk about where we are with cancer in 2021 because there's a lots of preconceived ideas about cancer, a lot of misconceptions, um, but there's an awful lot happening at the moment. So it's an exciting time to be a doctor treating patients with cancer. So I thought I'd just go through a few um, interesting things that are happening in, in the cancer field. So cancer has been around with us for an awful long time. So um, if we look back in antiquity, um, it was mentioned in ancient Egypt in, in papyri that were discovered. Um, we have a, a Neolithic skeleton from 5000 BC, BC, which showed evidence of leukemia. And the sort of cause of cancer and the, the treatment of cancer has really been a scientific conundrum for, for many centuries. So, so this is a disease that's been with us for an awful long time. It's certainly not <clears throat> a new phenomenon. And if we just think about, well, what is cancer? So this is basically when abnormal cells start to divide, divide in an uncontrolled way. Um, and the risk with cancer, that these cells may eventually spread into other tissues. So they spread via the lymphatic system or by the bloodstream and then lead to metastatic disease. And that's where cancer becomes a very serious problem and ultimately can be faith. Faith, um, can be fatal. Um, now there's more than 200 different types of cancer but if we think about the UK what are our common cancers and we would talk about four common cancers being prostate, colorectal, um, breast and lung cancer um, and they probably would account for the majority of cases we see in the UK. So I'm just going to go through this talk by just asking you to think about um, a few questions. So we don't really have a um, voting capacity here, but just start thinking about these sort of concepts. So my first question to you all, one in two people in the UK will get cancer. What do we think about that? Is that statement true or false? So that is true, which is quite a scary statistic, isn't it? To think that one in two people in the UK are going to get cancer. So. We say one in two of us will be diagnosed with cancer, but we have to move away from thinking that that's a dreadful statistic that's frightening. That means one in two of us are going to die from cancer. That absolutely is not the case these days. So our survival rates have increased significantly with cancer over the last 30 to 40 years. So many, many people will survive a diagnosis of cancer. So if they're diagnosed at an early stage, they're very likely to have curative treatment um, and will go on and have a normal life expectancy. So one in two of us may develop cancer, but it certainly doesn't mean one and two of us will die from cancer. Why are we seeing this large increase in cancer numbers? And probably the most significant impact is the fact that we, we are an aging population. So the biggest risk factor for cancer is old age. We know that we've got an aging population. So we're starting to see more and more cases of cancer because patients are generally just living longer. So I have many patients with prostate cancer in their 80s. They're very fit and well, very keen to be actively treated. Um, so it is ultimately a, um, a cancer. Cancer is a, is a disease disease of older people. So we've got longer patients living longer, so more people are getting cancer. But again, I'll just re-emphasize that. Just remember, more and more people are surviving cancer. So our survival rates are continuing to improve. 
And if anyone's particularly interested in looking at cancer statistics, I would absolutely recommend the Cancer Research UK website because they've got lots and lots of information there that's freely accessible. Um, and you can get some really good statistics and patterns of what's happening with cancer, particularly in the UK. So if you look at these latest sort of figures from a couple of years ago, 367,000 cases of cancer. So you can see it's a big burden um, on the NHS. And I've said that the common cancers um, account for probably more than half of our new cancer diagnosis, so breast, prostate, lung or bowel cancer. And look at that, the peak age rate of cancer in the UK, 85 to 89 years. So you see what I mean about the fact that this is often a disease of, of older patients. So, so a common problem for, for us in the NHS. My next question to you. So thinking about treatment. So a patient is always going to lose their hair with chemotherapy. What, what do we think about that? Is that true or is that false? That is false and absolutely that's something that patients often come to clinic with this preconceived idea that they're likely to lose all their hair with treatment and that frightens them because it's a very visible sign that they've got cancer. So treatment of cancer. So if we think about the main treatment modalities, we're thinking about things like surgery, chemotherapy or radiotherapy and often patients will actually have a combination of these treatments. So they may have an operation perhaps to remove a breast cancer, then they'll go on to have chemotherapy or radiotherapy afterwards to try and reduce the risk of that cancer coming back. So combination treatment is very common. Um, and we've got a lot of newer treatments coming on board which I'll touch on a little bit later, um, becoming a little bit more personalised. So we're looking at tumours now on an individual basis and does a cancer have a particular molecular target or a particular genetic feature that we can target in terms of, of trying to treat it. Chemotherapy, how does it work? So it's basically trying to target any rapidly dividing cells. So we know cancer cells proliferate very quickly. So chemotherapy, a very good treatment. It's going to try and damage the DNA of the cancer cell beyond any repair. It's going to stop the cell from going through the normal cell cycle and ultimately prevent that cell from dividing. So a very good treatment for cancer. And chemotherapy drugs can work in a variety of ways. And it's rare probably that we would just give one drug to a patient. And we often use combinations of treatment because you can see here, different chemotherapy agents will have an effect in a different way. So some, for example, might interfere with mitosis and they're what we call spindle poisons um, and they'll have a, a chemotherapeutic effect. Others may be anti-metabolites or they'll interfere with DNA transcription or replication. So hopefully you can see by perhaps combining more more than one drug, you get multiple hits on those cells and you get a cumulative effect and a therapeutic effect. And not all these drugs will cause hair loss. So for example, um, I treat bladder cancer. The chemotherapy that I give to my bladder cancer patients doesn't cause hair loss, um, but the chemotherapy I give to prostate cancer patients does. So, so it is a myth that all chemotherapy will lead to hair loss. So some, some chemotherapy drugs absolutely don't and are very well tolerated. And when we're consenting a patient for chemotherapy, because obviously we're going to explain to a patient what that treatment's likely to involve, and these would be the very common side effects that we'd counsel a patient about. So it's not unusual to feel tired when you're having chemotherapy. Nausea and vomiting can be um, a side effect of treatment. Infertility can be an issue. Now, having already told you that cancer is often a disease of older patients, of course, it can affect younger patients as well. So you may, for example, have a young man with testicular cancer um, and he's likely to be rendered infertile by chemotherapy. So that's someone, for example, we might encourage to sperm bank before they start their treatment so they could then go on and have a family in the future. We've talked about hair loss, but we've said that's not absolutely um, guaranteed with chemotherapy, but it is a very distressing side effect for patients and I've certainly had some patients who have refused to have chemotherapy because they don't want to lose their hair. Bone marrow suppression, I would say, is a clinician by far the most worrying side effect of chemotherapy because the cells in our bone marrow multiply very quickly as well and chemotherapy will have an effect on those. So chemotherapy causes neutropenia, so lowering the white cell count. It causes thrombocytopenia, so lowering of the platelet count as well. So you have patients who have a compromised immune system on treatment. Um, and we do worry about patients if they've had chemotherapy, they become unwell, they have a fever, um, they have... Um, 
evidence of sepsis. These are patients who can get really unwell post chemotherapy. So that's something that we counsel patients about very carefully. Gastrointestinal toxicity. So I've said chemotherapy targets rapidly dividing cells. So you think about the lining of the, the bowel. You've got epithelial cells that rapidly turn over. So mouth ulcers, diarrhea, quite common with chemotherapy. Neuropathy, nerve damage. So you can get a, a neurotoxic effect with um, chemotherapy and that can be permanent. So that's you know, a disaster for a patient who you've perhaps given curative treatment to and they end up with long term side effects from chemotherapy um, and nail changes as well. So your nails grow quite quickly and they will also be affected by chemotherapy. So quite a lot of side effects um, from chemotherapy um, in general. So I've just talked about chemotherapy, but what about my next question? True or false? Chemotherapy may become a thing of the past. So what do we think about that? So I would say that is actually a true statement because the treatment landscape is definitely changing for, for cancer patients. And one of the things that's looking very promising and something that's really exciting for us as oncologists is this concept of immunotherapy, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. So this is where we're now looking at the immune system to treat cancer, um, very different from what we achieve with chemotherapy. So we know that cancer cells are very clever. They've developed mechanisms for, for avoiding destruction by the immune system, whether that's various genetic changes or they have um, cell surface proteins that just allow them to sort of, you know, go under the radar of the immune system or they switch off immune cells. And immunotherapy is, is a relatively new treatment, um, but it's really trying to utilise the immune system to treat a, a number of cancers. And immune checkpoint inhibitors, by far one of the biggest breakthroughs in oncology, probably in the last five years or so. Um, so we're all using these drugs now in our day to day clinics. So a really exciting breakthrough. And this is so different to chemotherapy. This is about taking the brakes back off the immune system um, and allowing the immune system to help to treat the cancer. So we have um, PD-1 and CTL4 inhibitors, which basically release T cells to promote tumour cell death. So these um, have been a real breakthrough. Um, in terms of scientific development, in terms of, of treatment for cancer um, and actually becoming really common to use in, in the clinic and often replacing chemotherapy as some lines of treatment. Um, and just to show you here, really a dramatic response to immunotherapy, a patient with melanoma, really difficult cancer to treat in terms of chemotherapy, actually doesn't really respond very well to chemotherapy at all. But you can see here sequentially over time, what a dramatic response to treatment. So immunotherapy really changing the landscape. It's been used now, melanoma, for example, but lung cancer, colon cancer, I'm using it in my bladder cancer patients. So it's totally changing um, the treatment landscape for, for our cancer patients. And I thought I would mention CAR T cell therapy. So not something we're yet using really in oncology, but certainly my haematology colleagues are using this. Um, and again, this is manipulating the immune system. So taking T cells from a patient and then engineering them with specific tumour antigens, putting them back into the patient. And, and that's proving to be really effective treatment for things like leukaemia uh, and lymphoma. So I think this is watch this space for the future, because I think immunotherapy is definitely going to be um, something that develops over time and is showing real promise in, in some cancers that, that previously were very, very difficult to treat. The other option we have now as well is what we'd call targeted treatment. So again, it's moving away from that, you know, one drug killing everything with chemotherapy. And this is things like small molecule drugs and antibodies, where again, we're, we're trying to look at specific characteristics of a tumour cell and seeing, well, what can we do to stop that cell from growing? So whether it's depriving of its blood supply, um, promoting cell death, um, blocking hormones needed for growth. I mean, that's what we do in prostate cancer. We know prostate cancer needs testosterone to grow. And one of the mainstays of the treatment I give is just anti-hormone treatment, which is very effective for prostate cancer. So you're trying to interfere with all those pathways um, to try and knock out um, that benefit, that survival benefit that cancer cells have. Um, so you can see that chemotherapy is just only one tool in our armory in terms of, of trying to treat cancer. Um, and it's big news. So, so, you know, cancer, we've said it's common. It's often under the microscope in terms of what's happening. Um, and, and, you know, these are just examples I took from, from the press. And you can see, you know, everyone gets very excited about new breakthroughs. But I just would say also, 
you know, to take a drug from the lab to clinical practice takes many, many years and takes millions of pounds for drug companies to develop this. Um, and this is definitely a problem that we're going to face in the future within oncology. How are we going to fund all these fantastic treatments that are coming through? Because they are very expensive um, and I don't have an answer for that, but it's just to, to think about things. It's wonderful that we're having more and more treatment options for cancer, um, but these are very, very expensive treatments and a real challenge for the NHS. OK, my next question to you, 40 percent of cancers in the UK are preventable. What do we think about that? That's nearly half of the cancer in the UK. Is that correct? Are they really preventable? That is another true statement. Absolutely. So we know that our lifestyle choices absolutely have an impact on the risk of cancer um, and probably most of you would be able to tell me that smoking is a risk and um, being overweight is a risk but there's lots of things we do with our lifestyle particularly in the west and particularly in the uk um, that are increasing our risk of cancer so imagine that we could probably present prevent about 40 percent of the cases of cancer we're seeing um, and it's pretty obvious in terms of what we need to do. So look at that smoke free. So nearly 65,000 cases of cancer could be prevented each year in the UK just by trying to get people to stop smoking. And we always think of lung cancer and the smoking risk, but the biggest risk factor in the UK for bladder cancer is smoking. So it's really important um, that we try and encourage patients to, to, to not smoke because not just for cancer risk, but it's obviously a risk for respiratory disease. It's a risk for ischemic heart disease as well. Um, and we run lots of different campaigns you know we're trying to 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 make patients be proactive to educate them and say actually this is not good for you um, and you know if you can stop smoking over time your lifetime risk will will start to 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 regress again in terms of developing um, chronic illness so it's really important we think about lifestyle um, and cancer prevention keeping a healthy weight. Um, we have a problem with obesity in this country and I think we've seen that with the COVID pandemic we're seeing that overweight patients are probably more at risk of getting more unwell with COVID and it's the same with cancer so 18,000 cancer cases could be prevented every year if we try and keep a, a healthy weight. Eating a sensible diet so just fruit and vegetable look at that 15,000 cases could be prevented each year in the UK just by trying to adapt and do that classical five a day diet. Drink less alcohol. So we know absolutely alcohol is a risk factor for head and neck cancers, for gastric cancers. So again, it's about doing things in moderation and trying to, to lead a healthy lifestyle and minimising risks at work. So we know that certain occupations, you are going to be at risk of developing certain cancers. So again, it's about just being proactive um, and reducing our risk wherever possible. Another statement then to lead on from that. So cancer can be caused by infection. So is that true or false, given that I've just said we've had um, clinicians and scientists looking at this for hundreds of years in terms of etiology of cancer? So is that a true statement? It is. This is another true statement. So absolutely, cancer can be caused by infections. So we know, again, if we can minimise certain infections, we're going to also play a role in, in reducing our cancer risk. So again, infections in the UK will account for about 10,000 cancer cases every year. I would say, though, this is probably a much bigger global problem. So worldwide, infections are probably linked to about 20 percent of cancers. So that, that's a big proportion of cancers. So it's definitely a global problem. And again, it may come down to the fact that um, particular viruses, for example, may have an effect on the genes inside cells that control growth. Um, we know that chronic inflammation and infection um, can cause changes in immune cells. And again, that can promote cancer development. Um, certain infections will have an effect on the immune system and we've just said again about how we know that um, if the immune system if it's the breaks are on then cancer cells can evade discovery um, we would say here it's really important and again this is a bit of a, a preconceived misconception that some patients have but you know the stigma of having cancer you cannot catch cancer from someone so just because an infection may cause it it doesn't spread from person to person um, so cancer itself is not uh, something that you catch Thinking worldwide, so these are the infections that are probably the major problems. So we know hepatitis is the cause of primary liver cancer. So we may not see that desperately commonly in the UK, um, but in Africa, for example, that's a very big problem, primary liver cancer. Um, HIV is associated with cancers such as lymphoma and cervix cancer, but we have very good treatment now with antiretrovirals. Um, the risk of cancer is certainly reduced. HPV, so cervix cancer, head and neck cancers. And again, we now have a vaccination programme, which we know will help to improve 
improve the um, the risk of developing cervix cancer. I said in the UK that the biggest risk for bladder cancer is smoking, but actually worldwide it's a parasite that's the most common cause, schistosomiasis. So, so you can see that infection um, is, a, is a worldwide problem in terms of cancer risk, and particularly in developing countries where perhaps the healthcare infrastructure is not so good as here, don't have good vaccination programs. So these are things that we need to be thinking about on a, on a global scale. Where you live can determine your cancer risk. Now, why would that be important? What's the difference between living in a bungalow in Wembley or a big house in Newcastle in the UK? Is that really likely to determine your risk of cancer? That's another true statement. So absolutely where you live is um, does determine your cancer risk. Um, and again, um, some nice data from Cancer Research UK. And this is about looking at social deprivation and cancer, because again, this is very relevant in this country. Um, and you can see here, if you've got higher rates of social deprivation, you get much higher rates of certain cancers. So look at that lung cancer, very prevalent in areas where um, there's more socioeconomic deprivation and equally things like head and neck cancers and stomach cancers. So where you live definitely has an impact on your cancer risk. Now, why is that? So it's it's multifactorial and it's complicated, but there's there's quite a few different um, hypotheses as to why this is the case. So we've talked about smoking being a risk for cancer. We know that smoking rates are higher in the more deprived populations in the country, so that increases your risk. We talked about the fact that obesity is a risk factor for cancers. Well, we know that children and adults that live in more deprived areas are much more likely to be obese. So again, that's another risk. Risk. Screening uptake tends to be lower in um, the more deprived population. So the whole purpose of screening is that you either catch or diagnose a cancer before it's become uh, invasive or you're diagnosing it at an early enough stage that it's going to be completely curable. Um, and we have good screening programmes in the UK for breast cancer, for cervix cancer, for colorectal cancer, but the uptake seems to be lower in more deprived populations. More deprived populations often have less recognition of, of the worrying signs and symptoms of cancer. So, you know, I still find in my clinic, for example, I may have a patient who comes and he'll tell me that he's had blood in his urine for 12 months um, and he won't have thought of that as significant and he won't have recognised that that's a potential symptom of prostate cancer. So it's about people not recognising the red flag symptoms of cancer. Um, and it can be more challenging sometimes if you're in a more deprived area, you're perhaps your access to healthcare professionals, to GPs, etc can be can be more difficult um, and certainly we do seem to see that patients who live in more deprived populations also present much later and they present via an emergency presentation and presenting late with a cancer is nearly always going to be bad news because it means that your cancer is more advanced and perhaps it's much more um, unlikely to be um, cured in terms of treatment. So True or false? My last little question to you all, and, and this is really in homage to my colleagues. So the UCL Cancer Institute has some of the best cancer researchers in the world. Is that statement true or false? Well, I think, of course, you're going to know I'm going to say that's a true statement, but I think I would be confident enough that I could I could back that up really. So just a couple of people I'd like to mention. Um, and the Cancer Institute is the academic um, side of, of our oncology department at UCL. Um, very close collaboration between the scientific community and the medical community. So for example, Mariam here is one of my colleagues who works in lung cancer, um, but she also runs a scientific research group in the Cancer Institute um, and works with a number of colleagues where they've been doing some really innovative work in lung cancer, um, presenting in major international um, um, uh, journals and, and high impact journals. So, so really at the, at the forefront of groundbreaking treatment for, for lung cancer. So it's really exciting to, to work with these people. So working oncologists, they have a day to day medical practice, but equally they run a laboratory as well. And they have PhD students who are looking at various theories in terms of trying to improve cancer outcomes for people. So it's this real bench to bedside approach where you're really trying to, to translate the work from science into clinical practice. Um, I talked about CAR T cells earlier. So this was another one of my colleagues at the Cancer Institute who was involved with, with the um, cartel, uh, CAR T cell treatment for um, leukemia, so paediatric leukemia. So this, this is a real breakthrough in terms of treating young children um, who previously had you know awful leukemias 
that were potentially untreatable and CAR T cell therapy being a massive breakthrough. So, so the Cancer Institute, absolutely, um, you know, worldwide um, reputation, lots of fantastic clinicians, lots of fantastic scientists all working together. And you can really see that sort of important interplay between science and medicine and how we sort of all need each other um, to um, work together to try and improve care for cancer patients. So at that point, I probably will um, finish up and I'm happy to take any questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen if that's OK and see how we go. Thank you so much, Ursula, for that talk. I hope everyone found it very interesting and had a lot to learn from it. Um, we had a really good turnout of about 336 attendees. So um, I hope everyone really enjoyed it. Um, we have some time for questions now. So um, I'll just pick some of the questions that have been fielded to me. Um, one of the first ones is, in what ways will cancer treatment adapt after the COVID-19 pandemic? Oh, good question. So um, I think there's no doubt um, there's been collateral damage to, to cancer patients from, from the pandemic. So if we think back to March of last year, so the first lockdown, for example. So um, as, as clinicians, we were basically stopping all, all cancer treatment. So um, a lot of patients who perhaps were having palliative treatment, um, but it was still potentially going to prolong their life, all that treatment stopped. Um, and then if we think about the, the screening programs, a lot of those stopped, the two week wait referral stopped. So we now have this massive backlog, I think, of patients who haven't yet been diagnosed or who are going to be diagnosed at a much later stage. And I talked about the fact that it's obviously better to diagnose someone early on when they're likely to have curative treatment. So I think there will be, um, you know, an impact on that. And I think we'll probably see patients um, presenting with more advanced disease. Um, but, you know, we're now we've been up and running I mean, even during the second lockdown, we've still been recruiting patients to trials. Our treatments have been ongoing. So we have managed now to keep things ticking over for our patients. Um, and, you know, these are patients who would have been classed as extremely vulnerable. So they're all vaccinated. Um, so life goes on now. We have to keep on top of this prevalent disease. Um, but I think there will be there will be a, um, a lot, a lot of patients who perhaps are going to have a late diagnosis as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, it's challenging because it's hard enough as it is um, when it comes to cancer. Um, one of the other questions is what causes the cell mutations associated with cancer and are there any ways these mutations can be prevented? Good question. So, so there's numerous things that can cause it. So age will, over time, our cells will mutate and will we'll acquire various mutations as we get older. So, so, so that's just the natural aging process. Um, our lifestyle choices. So I talked about the, the risks of some of the things that we're doing. So think about smoking, for example. So over time, smoking will increase your mutational burden. And that's probably another thing why, why we develop cancers. Alcohol is probably the same. So, so, so the natural aging process, it's, it's normal to acquire mutations, but a lot of what we do, which isn't desperately healthy, is probably um, contributing to that as well. And then is, um, do you believe that stem cells could become a more beneficial treatment for cancer in the future? I think so. I think so, because, um, you know, if, if we if we look at, you know, one of the biggest problems we've got in cancer is treatment resistance. So eventually it feels like all our treatments eventually fail because cancer cells become resistant. So um, whether that's um, a, a sort of clone of cells that, um, you know, are always inherently resistant to a treatment over time. So so I think definitely going right back to the beginning um, and, and looking at things from a different way may definitely um, help in terms of future treatment. So stem cell therapy is, is, is again, another evolving um, sort of field. Um, and again, possibly more currently within the hematological cancers, but I think it's coming for, for common solid cancers as well. And could perhaps take over a chemotherapy like you mentioned. May well be, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's probably going to be a role for all our different treatments and it's about combination treatments. And I guess what we can't do very well yet, we can't identify patients where chemotherapy may not work so well and perhaps we should be thinking about something like immunotherapy or other patients who perhaps don't need to have chemotherapy at all and can have other treatments. So, so it's trying to pick out and eke out the right treatment for the right patient. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, do you think genomics will be more accessible in the NHS to provide personal personalized care? Oh, again, it's uh, it's it's probably a financial issue as well. I mean, I think you know certainly in the states, for example, people are are you know profiling their tumors and they're looking to see what what mutations are present, and we we certainly do that within the context of trials. Um, because it can influence the, the treatment that we give. So I, I think it's coming definitely for, for, for our cancer patients. I think if we've got targeted treatments that we know are effective, we should be looking for those patients who are likely to benefit for, from those treatments. And um, I think another question is, how does chemotherapy identify which cells are quickly reproducing and then target these cells. So it doesn't. It's it doesn't really. It's it's more that any any cells that are proliferating um, are likely to be killed by chemotherapy. So it's just it's a pan sort of cell type effect. So it's not that it's homing in on anything particularly. So so a cell that's growing rapidly. If you give chemotherapy, you're going to interfere with DNA replication. You're going to interfere with division, um, and you're going to have a, a, a kill effect on that cell. Um, but it won't. Just be the cancer cell it will be our hair follicles it will be our nails it will be the lining of our tra GI tract so it will have an effect that way as well. And then um, again related to therapy why is surgical oncology such as removal of the tumor itself not a main form of treatment? So it is and it can be so I guess let, let's think about a woman with breast cancer for example so she may have um, the breast cancer removed um, and at the time of surgery, all the cancer is gone. The surgical margins are clear. There's no cancer left behind. The pathologist will look at that cancer and say, OK, this wasn't a high grade. It wasn't it wasn't looking particularly aggressive. It hadn't spread anywhere. And that would be sufficient treatment for that patient. So for some patients, surgery is enough. The problem that we have is that patients are at risk of relapsing um, and we need to look at why they may relapse and often it's because perhaps it's a big tumour, it started to spread to the lymph nodes, it was a high grade tumour and then they're the patients that may need additional treatment so they may need things like chemotherapy or radiation therapy to reduce the risk of, of recurrence. So for some patients surgery is enough absolutely but um, that's not necessarily the case for everyone. And since you did use breast cancer as an, as an example, one of our questions is why are certain cancers such as breast cancer more common? So again, a good question. Um, and it's, you know, again, partly breast cancer, again, is it tends to be a cancer of older women. So, so we've said age is one of the the um, reasons why we're seeing it so commonly. There's a screening program for breast cancer. So we're probably identifying some cases through the screening program that we wouldn't necessarily know about. Um, and we know there are certain risk factors for breast cancer. So whether that's environmental, estrogen exposure, having children later in life, you know, there's lots of different things that are probably contributing to a risk um, of breast cancer. So, 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 you know, we're probably seeing all, all incidents of all cancers increasing but mainly, as I said at the beginning, that's probably partly an age thing. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a question about chemotherapy and um, why do it asks, why do some people that go through chemotherapy lose their hair and their hair grows back curlier or different color? That I absolutely don't have the answer to, but I've had patients where it's happened and it's quite extraordinary. So I've, I've not had them grow back a different color, um, but I've certainly had a couple of patients when their hair grows back, it's grown back curly and I don't know why. It's just one of those odd things with chemotherapy. I don't think there's any definite scientific basis to that. It doesn't happen very often. And again, um, related to the hair loss from chemotherapy, um, someone asked how do cold caps work to prevent hair loss? Oh, so cold cap is so um, it's a little bit, I think, like a, a, a jockey cap, for example. So, so basically it's it's a cap that a patient wears actually during physically during their chemotherapy infusion. So basically um, you cool the scalp. The scalp's got a very rich blood supply, so you're cooling the scalp down. So you're you're depriving it of its blood supply, um, which means that less chemotherapy gets into the scalp and then therefore you should not lose as much hair. So it's a pretty painful procedure. The patients that I've had who've had the cold cap say it's it's pretty tough going because you have to sit with this ice cold cap on your head 
before your chemotherapy infusion, during your chemotherapy infusion and afterwards. So it's not for the faint hearted, um, but it can work quite well. I mean, I've said hair, hair loss can be quite a distressing side effect for some patients. And, and you know, if, if they can do anything to, to try and reduce that, they're, 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 they will do it. So, um, so it's all about cooling the scalp, reducing the blood supply to the scalp, and then it has less of, of an effect, the chemotherapy toxicity. Um, we have some questions about um, future therapies, one of them being, is there a danger with immunotherapy of sparking autoimmunity? So that's a good question. So, so I talked about the potential side effects of chemotherapy. Um, immunotherapy has its own set of side effects and it's very different to chemotherapy. So we don't see hair loss, we don't see low blood counts, we don't see all the common chemotherapy side effects, but we do see what we call immune related reactions. So basically um, the immune system does go into overdrive almost and then you get side effects from immunotherapy. So it's not desperately common, um, but it can happen with immunotherapy. Um, and in the in the last month, I've, I've had a whole um, complete range of different immunotherapy side effects in my patients. So basically the immune system goes into overdrive and almost starts to attack self. So we th see things like pneumonitis, which is inflammation in the lungs, <clears throat> we see hepatitis, inflammation in the liver, um, we see all sorts of weird um, hormonal effects, so diabetes, thyroid problems, um, colitis, which is you know very severe diarrhea as a result of inflammation. So we definitely are seeing some side effects when the immune system goes into overdrive. And, that, and the way we normally deal with that is to give steroids, so high dose steroids help to dampen down that immune response. So th they're rare side effects, but they do happen. Um, and we do counsel patients about that risk because, you know, ev everything we do in oncology does have a consequence. So patients need to be informed of the potential side effects of treatment, but they're usually manageable side effects. But yeah, you're right. So the immune system can, can sort of go into overdrive a little bit with these drugs. Um, and a question about CRISPR technology and um, will it have a profound impact on the possible prevention and treatment of genetically predisposed cancers? Perhaps that's something. Um, it's um, does CRISPR Cas9 uh, does CRISPR technology have a profound impact on the possible prevention and treatment of genetically predisposed cancers as a possible treatment? Oh, I think that's something I'd have to leave to the to the scientists. I mean, I think, you know, we, we do know certainly that some cancers are inherited. So there are familial cancers. Um, I'm not sure how far we're along with, with actually eradicating those. So it's more that we can screen patients for those or you can identify family, families at risk. Um, in terms of eradicating that entirely, I think I'd, I'm, I, I don't know is the honest answer to that. Perhaps it's something the new generation of absolutely can can look into. Um, our next question is, can you get the same variety or type of cancer after recovering from the same type of cancer a few years um, or months before? So I guess about relapse? You can, yeah. So, so you know, any cancer can relapse and any cancer can relapse potentially um, at any time. So, I mean, I, I've seen breast cancer relapse at 20 years. So you would absolutely assume you've been cured, wouldn't you, by the time you get to 20 years. But I've certainly seen patients relapse. So your your highest risk of, risk of relapse is in the first year or two after your initial diagnosis. And so we, we follow up our patients quite closely. So if you've had curative treatment, we'll still be doing scans and blood tests to make sure that patients aren't relapsing. Um, there is always a risk of relapse and it's it's usually with the same type of cancer and if you if you biopsy the site of relapse it's often identical to your original primary tumour um, and I think that whole risk is, is because of what we call micro metastatic disease so you've got these patients who perhaps they had their surgery maybe they had radiotherapy uh, but there were tiny cells left behind that we can't see on a scan or on a blood test and eventually those cells will seed and, and develop metastatic disease and that, that's one of the reasons we give chemotherapy sometimes after an operation because we know there is this risk of micro metastatic disease so we try and combat that by giving chemotherapy in what we call adjuvant treatment so in addition to to try and reduce the risk so for example in breast cancer in bowel cancer in lung cancer um, adjuvant chemotherapy is, is a very big part of what we do and it's all about okay the surgery probably is curative but if we give some chemotherapy we're going to help reduce the risk of that cancer coming back but we can't eradicate that risk entirely. 
Um, and in terms of um, the role of genetics in cancer, it's well known that there are certain genes that predispose people to cancer. Are there any that mean that someone won't get cancer? I guess any genes that prevent people from getting cancer? I don't, I think probably not really. I think we, we certainly know that, um, you know, certain, you know, so let's say, for example, a, a BRCA mutation increases your risk of certain cancers. We know that there are certain familial colorectal cancer syndromes. Um, I think, you know, some some genes may be protective in terms of if they're not mutated, you're unlikely to develop a cancer. Um, but I don't think we've got any any patients who we know are fully protected. So I think it's much more about we can identify the risky genes as opposed to anything else. Um, and a question, I guess, more on the pathophysiology. So do cancer cells mainly avoid detection from the immune system through expressing MHC? So it, it's there's a variety of ways. So it's not just by MHC. So so um, I mean when we talk about CAR T cell therapy, that's a completely different mechanism, independent of independent of MHC. So so there's probably numerous ways that they they can they can go undetected. Um, and it's not I mean immunotherapy doesn't work for everyone. So it's not that the immune system is the only thing that's driving this. So um, and I'm not sure yet we fully understand why some patients do respond well to immunotherapy and others don't. So so it's 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 much more complicated than one simple immune pathway. Um, it's it's multifactorial, and and I think things, um, you know, we we accumulate mutations and other problems over time, and it's multiple pathways that are going wrong in terms of of our cancer sort of risk and development. Um, and a question about anti-hormonal um, treatments. Um, the question is. Um, are there any significant side effects since um, hormones are quite essential to human life? There absolutely there are. So, so I, I use prostate cancer as an example. So, so we know that testosterone, so the male sex hormone, is is often the thing initially that makes prostate cancer grow. So, one of our very good treatments for prostate cancer is to to medically castrate a patient. So, we lower the testosterone level, we deprive the prostate cancer of testosterone, and it's a fantastic treatment for prostate cancer. But of course, that has side effects. So, so if you lower a man's testosterone level, um, you know it affects mood, men get hot flushes, they gain weight, they lose their libido. Um, similarly, we use endocrine or hormonal treatment in breast cancer and again can have a similar effect. So if we're trying to block the effects of oestrogen, um, again, women will get hot flushes, they'll get osteoporosis. So, so absolutely we do there's consequences to what we do um but again it's about counseling a patient isn't it so you you tell them what the treatment's like to involve what they need to expect um if i think about you know my prostate cancer patients often you know when they first come to me with advanced disease that you know they've got prostate cancer perhaps that's spread to their bones they've got terrible pain they feel really unwell actually they feel so much better when they get on their hormone treatment because their cancer is responding so they can put up with the hot flushes and the tiredness because actually you know their pain's better they can get out and about and life goes back to normal so so there's always a bit of a payoff between the side effects and the benefits but m most treatments are pretty well tolerated and as long as you counsel a patient and they know what to expect they tend to cope very well with it. Mm -hmm. Um, a very interesting question is, has increased screening contributed to increased incidence of cancer? Um, many people that um, that I know refuse to get screened in the event that they end up becoming a statistic themselves. So good, it's a good question. Um, and I think, you know, there's the, the breast screening program is probably the one that's been around the longest. Um, and there are some arguments about you know has that really been beneficial so are we just finding things earlier um, but it doesn't change the outcome for the patient and I guess the other problem we have with screening is are we over treating as well so are we picking up things a bit earlier that perhaps would never cause a patient a problem um, and then we're, we're intervening I think you know, so the the breast cancer screening program definitely there are some people who feel that hasn't improved outcome, and it's just a, a you know a statistical sort of you know this is we we're going to screen all women above fifty. But I think thinking about um, the colorectal cancer screening. Um, system. I mean, you know, I saw a patient there a few weeks ago who was diagnosed with a very early stage <clears throat> bowel cancer because they participated in the national screening program. Now, they had no symptoms whatsoever, so they wouldn't have known that, that they had colon cancer. 
and probably that would have definitely not shown itself until they had much more advanced disease. So that's got to be a good thing that, that we're, we're catching these patients with much earlier disease and they can have an operation, they can have curative treatment, perhaps they don't even need chemotherapy or anything else. Um, so, so I think the screening program, um, you know, they are beneficial. And if you think about the, the cervical screening program, that's actually, it's not diagnosing cancer. It's about trying to pick up pre-cancerous changes so you can intervene before a patient has actually developed cancer. So again, that's got to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, another question asks, why was it decided that girls should urgently only receive the HPV vaccine? Whereas now, of course, boys and girls are like receiving. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I don't know why that was the case, because if we if we look at the statistics, we know, I mean, HPV is is a, a risk for a, a number of cancers. So, so it makes sense now that it's not just just young girls that are offered the vaccine. So, um, you know, I think sometimes sometimes it takes things to, you know, time to develop. You need to see the impact of a new vaccination program. It's about something that's acceptable to people um, and things take a little while to embed. Mm -hmm. um, another question is about um, cancer resistance to therapy and I'm if so that, sorry um, resistance to therapy okay, yeah yeah and is cancer resistance to a therapy something that can be passed down in you mean inherited exactly I think it's more an acquired thing that happens over time. So, so if we think about um, resistance to treatment, so there's there's multiple mechanisms by which cancer cells become resistant to treatment. So, uh, you know, I've said cancer cells are very clever. So, you know, they, they start to develop ways to, to become resistant. So sometimes it seems like, you know, they can pump the drug back out of the cell so, so it doesn't have its effect. They metabolise the drug that we give so it's no longer um, effective. Um, they can just use different pathways to proliferate. So if we've knocked out one pathway, well, they just go down a different route. So, so that's usually how resistance develops. So, so it's it's acquired over time. I don't think it's something that we directly inherit, um, and it's it's probably partly driven by our treatment. So, so we keep driving these cancers to change and then they just become inherently resistant to treatment. So it's sort of, for, certainly with advanced cancer, it's almost inevitable that patients will eventually become resistant to treatment. Um, and a slightly different question is, what are your thoughts on the use of aromatherapy on cancer patients? So I think Complementary therapies are fantastic, and I think we would really encourage our patients to to explore all of these options. So, so where I work at UCH, we we're in the Macmillan Cancer Centre, um, and Macmillan um, have funded um, a whole patient support area for our patients, so they can go and have Reiki, um, aromatherapy, massage, you know, lots of different complementary um, things that, that that really can help cancer patients. Do I think it helps treat cancer? I think probably not, but do I think it's beneficial for patients in terms of the, the stress and the anxiety and all the other things that are going on? I think absolutely. And, you know, again, when I think about perhaps my patients in particular, so, so prostate cancer patients, so I've said when they're on hormone treatment, they get lots of side effects. Um, you know, I've had a couple of patients who um, had terrible hot flushes and they went off and had acupuncture and they thought it was amazing. So I think, you know, as clinicians, we should be open to all of these things um, because, you know, as long as it doesn't interfere with our treatments, then we should be looking to complement things. And, and, you know, anything that makes a patient feel better or tolerate their chemotherapy or their radiotherapy better is a good thing. Um, and then what are your opinions on chemotherapy encapsulated in nanoparticles? such as liposomes and solid lipid nanoparticles? And what do you think the significance of these nanoparticle developments in the treatment of cancers? So we don't we don't use that much in terms of urology, so my cancers, but I know, for example, my colleagues that treat gynecological cancers have used liposomal drugs. Um, mm -hmm. Nanoparticles are used in colorectal cancer. So I think, yeah, these are, these again are innovative techniques and, and again, you know, not without side effects. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's not going to have some of the side effects we talked about. But, you know, all these things are, you know, ways of delivering drugs in a different way and trying to achieve an effect. So, so you know, in use at the moment, definitely in some of our common cancers. And I think we have time for one more question. And that is, why do you think childhood cancer has increased? Oh, again, another good question, and I'm not sure I definitely have the answer to that. I mean, I think 
there's got to be some environmental um you know risks with with cancer um and you know i talked about lifestyle so so there's probably i think it's again it's multifactorial um we don't we don't lead terribly healthy lifestyles we don't live in a planet that's not polluted there's lots of toxins you know i'm sure it's it's multifactorial um and i'm sure again lots of research going on to try and get to the bottom of it um so um i think i don't have an answer to that well, I guess, again, it's another instance of future research for absolutely, any, absolutely. any future UCL scientists. Um, I guess we I guess we can do one more question. Um, and that is, are mutations ma mainly caused by DNA damage due to oxygen radicals? And is there a way to stop this? So not not just I mean, there's, there's lots of things that can cause mutations. So, you know, again, if we look at the preventable risk, so you know, UV light, radiation, there's lots of things, you know, carcinogens that we're exposed to all the time. So smokers, you know, pollution, I think there's multiple things that are causing mutations um, and it's a cumulative effect over time. So it's not just one mechanism. It's not just one pathway, um, you know, cancer is that it's multifactorial what happens to it. and you need these multiple hits before it just all comes together and then a tumour forms so 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 more than one pathway definitely involved and one mechanism um another question is um what are the methods of deciding whether all cancer cells have been killed or not so I, d I don't know that we can ever say that really. So, so if we think about what do we do in clinical practice? So let's say we give a patient chemotherapy, we'll do a scan and if we can't see any evidence of the cancer, um, we think we've done a good job in terms of treatment. Some cancers we have tumour markers so we can do blood tests to, to look for any activity of cancer. So again, if I use prostate cancer as my example, so we have PSA, prostate specific antigen, which is a tumour marker made by prostate cancer cells. Um, that will often become undetectable if the patient's had a good response to treatment. Um, and, you know, we have very sensitive scans nowadays that, that can see tumours that are only millimetres in size. But again, there's no absolute test. So, so that's why we follow up patients because, you know, they may develop recurrence or there may be something microscopic that we're just not seeing. So, so we can use imaging, we can use blood tests, we can use physical examination to check our patients as well. Um, but you can't absolutely know that you've eradicated the cancer. You have to wait for time and hopefully that patient remains clear of disease. And I think a nice way to wrap up the Q&A is why did you decide to become a consultant in oncology and what drew you to prostate and bladder cancer? Oh, um, so I was, well, I, during my training, um, so when you train as a doctor, you, you train through multiple different specialties and I, I did oncology as a junior doctor um, and I just loved it and I've loved it ever since. I think, you know, in oncology, you get to know your patients really well. You know, you meet them um, when they're first diagnosed. They're really frightened of their diagnosis. They don't know what's going to happen. And with, with prostate cancer particularly, you know, my patients live for many, many years <clears throat> with metastatic disease. So you get to know them really well. You get to know their families. And it's an absolute privilege to, to go on that journey with them. Um, and prostate and bladder cancer, I think, you know, particularly prostate, you know, if I think about about 10 years ago, um, there was hardly any treatments for prostate cancer. We used to put our patients on hormones and hope for the best. Now we've got absolutely lots of different options and, you know, trials for patients. So it's been a real sort of, you know, dramatic change in, in landscape and it's really exciting. So so being an oncologist is fabulous. I, I, I love it. It's a real privilege to, to, to work alongside patients. With patients are amazing, what they deal with, what their families cope with um, and anything, you know, we can do to help them um, and improve their life. Um, it's, it's a really worthwhile thing. So I, I love it. I really enjoy what I do. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for all the amazing questions that everyone have, has asked. Um, Ursula, are there any final remarks? No, thank I mean, lots of very interesting questions. So, you know, hopefully, and I've tried to get over that, you know, cancer, it, it's, you know, everyone says to me, oh, it must be so depressing seeing cancer patients all the time. Well, it's not. You see, there's so much exciting treatment being developed. Patients can do very well. They can live a very active and normal life. And we're, we're curing lots of patients as well. So it's it's a really nice time to, to, to be involved in, in, in um, sort of the care of cancer patients.
And there certainly is a lot of hope for newer future. Theory. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Excellent. All right, I guess um, this is a good place to wrap up then. Thank you, Ursula, so much for thank you. for your time and for sharing uh, for sharing this with us. And thank you to everyone who attended the meetings. Thank you.